All right, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for what's been just a really great journey for us going through Malachi and um, really just hearing some tough truth and being confronted with some things in our own lives and and so good. The truth it hurts sometimes, um, but boy, it sets us free. So, Lord, I want to um, be the kind of people that uh, press into the truth that don't stick our, our heads in the sand about the reality of our, our lives, our challenges, our struggles, our temptations, all of it, but that we can walk honestly and openly before you. And so, Lord, as we, um, as we wrap up the series this morning, I pray that, um, that the truths of Malachi, would, that we would savor them and that they would become a part of our fiber and our being spiritually. And, and so uh, speak to us, Lord, deeply through these last few verses. And I believe that you have something important um, to impart to us here this morning. So do that, Lord, would you? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, it's great to see you all. Let's, uh, as you, you can make your way to Malachi chapter 4, and then as you do that, let me just uh, give you a couple of uh, announcements here. Um, we have a young adult uh, group that meets on Thursday nights. Woo! Yeah, <laughs> and uh, they are enthusiastic, and so um, we... I was walking through the grindhouse actually on Thursday night after a worship team songwriting session, and uh, and the group was in there, and it was vibrant and really wonderful. So, listen, if you're if you're in that category of young adult, um, I think the group would love to have you. And so that's Thursday nights at seven o'clock in the grindhouse. It's led by Ron and Brandy Rasmussen, and uh, and then guitar slinger Ben Hauser is in there making all the noise. So that's what's going on. <laughs> so, um, oh, then next week uh, begins Emphasis Month. Twice a year we have an Emphasis Month, and so we'll be unpacking what, um, what typically is called the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father Prayer, right, out of Matthew 6. And, and so we'll do a five-week sermon series around that, and, uh, and so... All of, we're going to do this throughout the church, high school ministry, junior high ministry, children's ministry, all the small groups are going to be uh, just meeting around the Lord's Prayer for that whole month. And, um, and so we're going to be teaching off the same outline, more or less. And, um, and so, but what I want to encourage you here this morning, if you haven't signed up for a small group for those five weeks, please do so, because it's going to enrich uh, you in a, in a huge way, and then you, you in turn are going to enrich somebody else by showing up at a small group too. That's the way it works. So uh, John would love to see you after service there in what we call the Connection Alcove or Connection Center back there, and he can get you plugged in to a small group. Okay, so um, this is the last sermon in the series, and appropriately, um, these are the last words of the Old Testament. There is no more writing after this in the Old Testament. So God goes silent now for 400 years. He will not speak. There will be no prophet in Israel speaking, thus saith the Lord. And so, so this is a big deal. And uh, there's, there's three things for us to consider from these last three verses. Again, the last words of the Old Testament. The first thing is the teacher. Well, let's, let's read our three verses first, shall we? Beginning at verse four. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So the first thing I want us to consider is the teacher in these verses. It's in verse 4. Remember the law of my servant Moses. So as God gets ready to go silent, he says, remember the law. 
Remember the law. Why would God say that? The law of Moses was at the center of the covenant that God made between him and his people, Israel. A covenant, of course, is it's a little more profound and binding, I would say, than a, than a promise or a contract. Okay, a covenant is something richer and deeper than that. And so... A covenant is the primary way that God has chosen to communicate to and relate to humans, to humanity. You have in your lap a Bible or a device that has Bible on it. And that Bible that you have is divided into two main parts. We call it the Old Testament, the New Testament. Testament is another word for covenant. It's the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So... The Old Covenant refers primarily to the conditional agreement between God and Israel as mandated by Moses, or mediated by Moses. I'm going to read to you out of Exodus chapter 19. You can turn there if you want. Uh, listen if you don't. Exodus 19 verse 5. God speaking to Moses. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant... You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and he called the elders of the people, set before them all these words that the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. So God comes to Moses and says, here's the deal. If you do what I'm asking you to do and you keep the rules of the covenant and so on, things are going to go well for you. So Moses says, absolutely. He calls the leaders together, lays on them what God laid on him. And they're like, yes, we are in. We are so in. So the old covenant was a conditional agreement whereby God declared, if you obey and keep my covenant, Things will go well for you. So now, you follow Exodus, next chapter, God gives them his Ten Commandments, chapter 20, and then they confirm the covenant, they ratified it in chapter 24, I'll read it to you, Exodus 24, 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules, and the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We are so into this. Absolutely, we are all in. Hey, God, you can count on us. Now, now, now flash forward just, just about eight chapters or so, and you come to chapter 32, and, and Moses is up on the mountaintop, and he's getting the, the hand-autographed, signatured Ten Commandments scribbled into, God doesn't scribble, written beautifully, I'm sure, into the rocks the two rocks, tablets of stone. And while Moses is getting the hand autographed commandments from God, the children of Israel are doing their best to break all those commandments. They are drinking lots of alcohol, taking off their clothing, and dancing around a golden cow. You know the story. Moses comes down <laughs> with the commandments, with those tablets, and you saw what Charlton Heston did. He broke them, didn't he? So the problem, the problem, the deficiency with the old covenant was that it, it was conditioned upon the obedience of the children of Israel. So, so, so that begs the question, why, why is God saying at the end of the Old Testament, remember the law of Moses? If God's people are unable to really keep it, and they weren't, they never really did, then, then why is God saying remember it? Well, here's, here's the short answer, and at least I think the main piece of the answer to that question is that the law was primarily designed to be a teacher. The law of God, the commandments, were primarily designed to be a teacher. Now, why do I say that? Because Galatians 3.24 says this, So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. 
Now that word guardian in the ESV, I use typically the ESV Bible, and that word guardian is a word that, word that carries the idea of teacher or tutor, and it comes from uh, in, in the first century, among the Greeks and the Romans and the wealthier class, the name was applied to a trustworthy slave who was, in char- who was charged with the duty of raising the, the small boys in particular and, and educating them and training them morally to be virtuous. And, and so this trustworthy slave would be the guardian of the child and, and that child could not even go outside of the house without the guardian until they were of adult age. So here's the deal. The old covenant, the law, was never meant or designed to justify us before God as though in doing our best to keep it would make us right before a holy God. That was never, never the design. It was always meant to be a teacher, a tutor, that would lead us to Christ. Hebrews 7.19 says, the law never made anyone perfect. Romans 3.20, for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So, so far from justifying us and far from making us holy, the, the law actually makes us aware of our sinfulness, makes us aware of our deficiency and our inability to keep it. Those of you who are a bit older, or at least as old as me, you, you may have had teachers in school that, well, did anybody ever get their knuckles wrapped with a ruler. Okay, this, this was pretty common in, in my school growing up. And more than once, I, I had my knuckles whacked with, with a ruler because I was goofing off, right? And so the school teacher, keeping control, keeping everybody on, on task, you know, would use, use the, the ruler. And, uh, and so I say that to say this, God gave us 10 commandments to to try and keep, and when we fail, our our knuckles get wrapped metaphorically. We we get a whack, we realize, hey, I can't do, I can't keep the, my knuckles hurt, I need somebody to save me, that's what I need. The old covenant was a teaching covenant, not a saving covenant. And so it was always meant to lead God's people to Christ, and into the new covenant. So the new covenant is not based upon our faithfulness and and our ability to keep our commitment and all that. It's completely based on God's ability and his faithfulness to his promises. That's the new covenant. Hebrews 8, 6 puts it like this, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it's enacted on better promises. Better promises. Why are they better? Because God makes the promises and we're not making the promises. So it's a much more solid and stable covenant. And once we've come to Christ, then we're no, un, no longer under the knuckle-whacking law. The law still serves us, but we're not under it like we were before. Listen, law-keeping, and that's old covenant stuff, and God's people promise, we'll do it. We'll keep the law. We'll meet you halfway in this covenant. But they didn't do it. They failed miserably. I'm sure they were sincere when they said, yes, we're in. We'll do it. But they just didn't have what it takes to keep the law, just like I don't. And you don't either. So you who are doing your best to keep the law and be this good, virtuous person, you're discovering that you can't fully keep it. And so your knuckles are a little bloody because of it. Well, listen, that law is leading you to Jesus. Well, the second thing this morning 
from our three verses is the PR person, the, the public relations person. Um, look at verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So here's the question um, that people have wrestled over. Is this referring to John the Baptist? Is he sort of the incarnation, the second incarnation of Elijah in some way? And my answer to that is, is figuratively, John the Baptist fulfills this. What do you mean? Well, let me read it to you. Luke 1.16 Speaking of John the Baptist, he will turn away many of the children of, or turn many rather of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So this speaking of John the Baptist applying Malachi 4 Right? Turning the hearts of the children to their father, just like Malachi 4 says, that's being applied to John the Baptist, who it says has come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He's not literally Elijah, but he's figuratively like Elijah. But in addition to John the Baptist's figurative fulfillment, the scripture hints at a very literal fulfillment. The book of Revelation is a weird book. <laughs> it's full of monsters and uh, creatures and death and blood and, and all kind of stuff. There's numerous interpretive grids um, that people use to try and make the book cohere and you know, get a handle on it and all that. But I take the futurist approach, which, which is simple to say that... Um, that, that I believe most of the book of Revelation is, is going to be fulfilled in the future. So we're going to see that unfold in future. It's not, you know, fulfilled already. So, and, and that's the view that makes the most sense to me. But in chapter 11, two guys show up in Jerusalem at the beginning of what Jesus called in, in Matthew 24, the tribulation. The tribula How many have heard of the tribulation? Right, you've read the Left Behind books or saw the movie or whatever, and so you have a little bit of a understanding or a conceptualization of that. But Jesus predicted in Matthew 24 that before he came back bodily, physically to planet Earth, there'd be a really tough time. He called it a time of tribulation, and so he was identifying a certain seven-year period of time that that would immediately precede his return. And this seven year period would be horrible. It would be the worst time the earth has ever seen, Jesus said. And especially for anyone who is wanting to maintain any kind of fidelity with God. So it's gonna be very hard. So two men are sent by God to Jerusalem at the beginning of this horrible time known as the tribulation period. And they're, they're spoken of in Revelation chapter 11, verse three, where it says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them. This is how he is doomed to be killed. They have power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. They have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. So as soon as the tribulation, this future period, this seven year period starts, two men are sent by God to Jerusalem to, to witness to the truth, to prophesy powerfully to the people on earth at that time. What does John mean that they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands? Well, he is simply explaining what Zechariah said in Zechariah chapter four, verse 11. And I said, who are these two olive trees in the right and the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and said, what are these two branches of the olive trees which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? And he said, don't you know who, what these are? No, I don't. And then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. 
So John, in Revelation, explains that this is what Zechariah was talking about, and I believe this is what Malachi was talking about in Malachi 4.5. I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So, so one of these two witnesses that will be in Jerusalem on the first half of the tribulation period, one of the two guys will be Elijah, I believe. The Jews have long expected Elijah's return, by the way. As a matter of fact, remember Elijah predated uh, Malachi by a couple hundred years. And yet Malachi, or God through Malachi, makes this prediction that Elijah is going to return. And so when John the Baptist showed up on the scene, they asked him, are you Elijah? In John chapter 1, verse 21, they asked John the Baptist, are you Elijah? And he said, no. When Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? What's the word on the street about me? And they said, well, some say you're Elijah. It's because people were expecting Elijah. To this very day, when religious Jews celebrate the Passover meal, they will have an open chair. Guess who the open chair is for? It's for Elijah. They're expecting the return of Elijah. Another reason that we can say that one of the two witnesses of Revelation 11 will be Elijah is that John tells us that uh, there'll be two major components. They'll have two powerful <laughs> ministry tools <laughs> available to them. One is the ability to shut up the sky that it won't rain. The other is to call down fire. That's two things Elijah did in his life, right? He, he prayed and it did not rain for three and a half years. Drought happened. And he called down fire. You remember, um, it's in 1 Kings, I want to say 18, 17 or 18, right in there. But um, King Ahaziah's soldiers, they, they were sent to arrest Elijah because he didn't like Elijah's prophecy, and so a captain with 50 guys go out to arrest Elijah, and, and fire is called down, and they are burned to death. So a second captain with 50 men is sent out to apprehend Elijah, and the same thing, Elijah calls down fire, and they are burned to death. A third captain with 50 men goes out to get Elijah, and this captain sees all the charred remains of his comrades, decides to take a little different approach, he gets down on his knees and says, Elijah, would you go with me? And Elijah says, sure. <laughs> All you had to do was ask. Apparently, Elijah won't have changed all that much when he appears in the end times. Fire. Shutting up the sky from rain. Who is the second witness of Revelation 11? Well, most believe it to be Moses. Moses and Elijah appear together, some of you know this, on the Mount of Transfiguration. When Jesus was transfigured, the disciples were sleeping. They woke up, they saw Jesus transfigured. He was shining brighter than the sun. And Moses and Elijah were talking to him. And, and it says that essentially they were counseling him. Because the cross was approaching and, and the disciples didn't understand it. They, didn't, they just didn't get it. And Jesus needed an adult conversation at that point in his life. And so Moses and Elijah, they ministered to him together. But more compelling than that is the fact that in the Jewish mind and in any Bible scholar's mind, Moses is the representative of the law. Elijah, the representative of the prophets, the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets. Remember the law. I'm sending Elijah. One last point this morning, and that is the result, the result Verse 6, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Some believe that the turning of, of hearts, uh, children to, 
fathers, fathers to children, refers to actual families in John the Baptist's day. That, uh, that, that his ministry, uh, which it did, history tells us that John the Baptist's ministry had a positive effect on families in Israel. And so, and we love that, right? We, we, we love the family unit. We want to fight for the family. We want to help families flourish. We want to help marriages make it. We want, that's such an important thing. But, but scholars agree that this turning of hearts, fathers to children, children to fathers, refers primarily to the Jews turning to their ancestral fathers. Now, why, why do we make that, that sort of a claim? Well, the reason for this is that Luke quotes the Malachi passage. We already read it, Luke 1, 16 and 17. But he substitutes, Luke does, for the heart of the children to their fathers, the substitution is the disobedient to the wisdom Wisdom of the just. So, so there's going to be a turning. The disobedient are going to turn to the wisdom of the just. And so what we, what we take that to mean, we take that to mean is that there's going to be a reconciliation affected between the unbelieving, disobedient children and their believing ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Elijah, and so on. Okay, so you, you follow in this. There's going to be unbelieving, disobedient chi- Jewish children, i.e. the Jews in the last days. They are going to turn the effect of Elijah's ministry and the law. They will turn to, their, to the wisdom of their fathers, the just, those who are justified. So this puts an eschatological grid on this, doesn't it? This is future. So we have to ask the question, is there a future for national, ethnic Israel? The Jews. There's no lack of controversy surrounding this subject, but let me just read Romans 11.1. Paul says, I ask, then has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Has God rejected his people Israel? Paul says, no way. And he points to himself as an example. Now, y'all know that when when Jesus died, rose from the dead, and and appeared for over 40 days and so on, he commissioned his, you know, the 120, and, and, you know, spoke to over 500 at once and all of that, then ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit fell, and thousands, 3,000 on the first day, 5,000 shortly after, Jews primarily became followers of Jesus. So, So a number of thousands of Jewish people became the first Christians. Christians. But the greater portion of Israel rejected Christ. Even when, when Pilate was offering them their king, if you remember this from the Gospels, the, the leaders of Israel, the religious leaders said, we have no king but Caesar. That was a a national rejection of Messiah. But some thousands would be saved, and yet the greater portion would not. So has, has God rejected Israel? Paul says no, and he points to himself and says, God isn't through with Israel. Look at me, I'm saved. Now the point Paul is making is not so much the fact that he was saved, but the way that he was saved. The way that Paul was saved is a picture of how Israel is going to be saved. What do you mean? You remember the story, Acts chapter nine, Paul was on a rampage. Saul of Tarsus was the leader of the the stamp out the Christian movement. And so he was leading his soldiers into homes. They were grabbing dads and throwing them into prison. They were throwing people on the ground and forcing them to blaspheme and deny Jesus. He was having people killed and executed for being a worshiper of Christ. This was Saul of Tarsus. And then on his way to Damascus, he was knocked down to the ground. And he was physically blinded, but spiritually his eyes opened So 
so too at a time when persecution will be coming down on Israel, when Jerusalem will be surrounded and about to be annihilated in the tribulation period, what's going to happen? Well, suddenly the Lord's going to appear. And like Saul of Tarsus, Israel will realize that they erred greatly. And they will turn to him and they will be saved. Zechariah 13, 1 puts it this way. On that day, there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Then in verse 6, they will ask the Lord, what are these wounds in your hands? And Jesus will answer, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. Then verse nine says, they will call upon my name, I will answer them, and I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. What a day that'll be. When Jesus shows up and they go, what are those, those wounds? And isn't it fascinating that Jesus says, oh, I got these in the house of my friends. That's grace. And Jesus will say, you're my people. And they will say, you're the Lord our God. And Israel, God's people Israel, in so doing, they are turning away from their disobedience and unbelief and turning to the wisdom of the just. In other words, this is what their forefathers had been saying all along, that it was always about Jesus. Every law, every sacrifice, everything was pointing to Jesus. So Paul points to himself and says, is God through with Israel? Consider me and my conversion as an illustration of what is going to happen eventually, eschatologically. So here we are, nearly 2,000 years since the destruction of Jerusalem and the dispersion of the Jews into all the world. And, and I mean, amazingly, in the late 1800s, Jews started to, to head back into the land, trickling in picked up a little more momentum in the first half of the 20th century. Then the Holocaust took place. And all of a sudden, there was, there was worldwide sympathy for the Jews and for their plight, which it then was the, the, the thrust behind the idea of granting Israel a nation status again. So after 1,900 years of non-existence, Israel existed again. Nobody other than the scripture could have ever predicted it. But here we are. So will national ethnic Israel be saved by virtue of their heritage? The fact that they are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Nope, they won't. They will be saved the same way you and I are, by coming to personal faith in Jesus Christ. Again, Romans 3.20, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law for the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Did you catch that? The law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, bear witness to what? What do they speak of? What are they shouting? That there is a righteousness apart from the law. That's been the story the whole time. That's been from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. God is providing something we can't manufacture. And so the story has been consistent. And in that day, at the return of Christ, a, a certain large number of Jews are going to realize that all the voices of their forefathers, the voices and the voice of the Bible, all speak in perfect harmony 
It's never been about you keeping the law. Just like it's never been about you keeping the law. It's always been about Jesus and what he's done for you. Remember the law of Moses. I'm gonna send Elijah. And in that day, your heart is gonna turn to your forefathers. And you're gonna understand what they were saying all along. Let's pray. Lord, we um, are grateful for those of us who have come to terms with our sinfulness and our deficiency and our inability to keep the commandments. It's impossible. It's a fool's errand. But the law, as we have looked at this morning, was never meant to justify us was never meant to be the, the ticket we get, we use to get in in the last day, to be right with you. Here's my ticket. I kept these rules. But it was meant to be a teacher, a guardian, to bring us to Christ and hand us off. So, thank you, Lord, for that. And um, I suppose there's probably a few here this morning that maybe have just been taking that approach to it all. And so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do my best. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and be a virtuous person and try and do good. Um, but they discover that there's always just this nagging iniquity inside and impurity and thoughts that can't be controlled. And sometimes those thoughts come out in words. And, and so maybe, Lord, this morning, they're coming to the realization that, that they need a savior. That there's just these, these two stubborn, unchangeable facts of life. We're born and we die. And there's got to be a point to it all. There's got to be a reason for that. And indeed there is. So, Lord, would you just, by the power of the Holy Spirit, draw anyone who needs salvation here this morning and, and draw them to saving faith in Christ. So with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to invite you at this time to give your life to Jesus, to put your faith in him. He is the solution to the dilemma. He is the one savior of the world. He died for you, paid for your sins. So if you're ready to put your faith and trust in him, I'm gonna invite you to raise your hand right now. And, and then I'm gonna lead you in a prayer to receive Christ. So if that's you, raise up your hand and we'll pray. All right. God bless you right down here. Anybody else? All right, I see your hand over here. God bless you, man, back here. Way over here on the side. Gotcha. All right. Anybody else? All right. So if you raised your hand just now, I want you to pray this prayer. Repeat it after me and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe in you that you died on the cross for me, 
and you rose from the dead. So I put my faith in you. So come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my life to you. Now help me to walk with you and to learn about you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome those who raised their hand this morning.